For me, neuroscience really gives me a feeling of hope. Um, often as a social worker, you can feel quite stuck. You can feel quite frustrated and um, networks can feel quite stuck and also frustrated. Um, but neuroscience really conveys a message of hope that actually there is um, a, a good chance at a better outcome and it gives me confidence in the work that we're doing, um, you know, and, and, and yeah, great confidence that through a sort of shared understanding of a child's life and um, a shared commitment towards um, how we're going to work with that child, we can bring about a better outcome. Yeah, I think um, it moves, it helps you to move away from focusing on blame and labels where it can be really easy to blame a child for the way that they're behaving or to label them as just the naughty child. Actually, through understanding a bit more about what's going on in their brain and what went on um, when they were experiencing um, adverse experiences as young children, we can understand why they're now responding in the way that they are. And actually, that's not their fault. Actually, it's, you know, it shows that they're really resilient. Their brain has adapted to be able to cope with challenging situations. Um, and like James said, it's not game over. It's never too late because we know also that the brain is very um, malleable. <laughs> and, um, and that doesn't just switch off at a certain age that carries on into adolescence. And and so there's always a chance to make a difference. And actually, if you've got the knowledge, then you're equipped, aren't you, with the tools that you need to understand what's going on and what can be done about it. When I first started learning about this research, I was trying to think of a way to help myself understand it and, um, and about what's happening for a child um, developmentally and so the analogy that I've come up with is that um, it, it's about your environment so if we imagine we've got a child growing up somewhere really cold like the North Pole and a child growing up somewhere hot like the desert the child in the North Pole needs different things than the child in the desert so the child in the North Pole needs a snowsuit and lots of warm clothes and all the rest of it and the child in the desert needs lots of water and sun cream blah 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 now, neither of those children are right. They need different things because they live in different places. And if they were to swap and live in each other's places, neither of them would be equipped for their new environment. And so if instead of thinking about the North Pole or the desert, we think about a home where, um, for whatever reason, parents aren't able to always be there for the child, aren't able to give them the attention that they need, maybe there might be scary things going on, that child is going to have adapted, now we know through thinking about neuroscience, to cope with that one environment. And then we've got a child in, in a home which is maybe a bit more consistent and they're experiencing lots of love and warmth and going to school and can deal with all the rules at school. If the child from this home comes to live in this home, they're not going to be able to cope in that environment straight away because just like the child at the North Pole coming to the desert, they've not got the things that they need. And that doesn't mean that the child's at fault. Actually, they've just come from a different environment where they had to act in a different way. And so there's no point blaming them now for not responding in the way that we'd expect them to in this new environment, like in the foster home or at school. Um, and so for me, thinking about it like that helps me to understand what that might feel like for the child being in that different environment and um, reframe my expectations of, of what we, we want from that child. The research helps us when we think about safer caring plans for foster carers um, because it explains why children might be more susceptible to certain risks. Children in care might be more susceptible to certain risks. So thinking about a child that maybe came from a home where they were neglected and didn't have as much attention as would have been good for them, they might be then um, more vulnerable to seeking that in places that aren't so healthy or safe, such as on the internet, um, or might be more susceptible to being 
groomed and ending up in a gang or running county lines. Um, and I think that's something that we were aware of, but this research helps understand what's actually going on for the child and the processes in their brain that have led them to having that latent vulnerability. There's uh, a lot of rejection that can happen for a child who has, you know, experienced um, trauma in their, in their younger life. Um, and it sort of manifests through a lot of perhaps sabotage of relationships and being quite difficult to form a relationship with, um, which then translates into bullying. I think it's really important that the adults around the child are able to um, appreciate the knock-on effect of their response to you know, their past trauma and past experiences um, and just how isolating that can be um, you know, when it's sort of rejection after rejection. Um, the effects of that can be really, really difficult for a child and I'm quite keen for foster carers in particular to have an appreciation of that um, because I feel like they can potentially be the one person that really understands um, what it's like to navigate a world where you are constantly being rejected based on your survival uh, response and your presentation that you know, needs some tweaking but was once upon a time quite rational. One of the things I hear a lot from foster carers is, you know, I did this for them and I tried this and it just didn't work. You know, it's as if they just don't care. Um, and actually, it's not that they don't care, it's just that those patterns have not actually formed within their, that child's brain. Mm, yeah. um, but it's, uh, you know, it's, it's what we would expect of, you know, our birth children perhaps, or, you know, children who haven't had those challenges mm. to be able to accept rewards and respond accordingly. Um, but again, it's about holding in mind that, you know, for this particular child, that doesn't necessarily correlate. It's important for foster carers to be um, taking photos, recording what's going on, writing their logs so that they're they're kind of keeping a memory for the child of, of their time and focusing on the positives. Um, and then I suppose they can use that to remind the child of those good times um, where their autobiographical memory system might not be, or is kind of being negatively impacted. Yeah, um, one of the things we speak a lot about with foster carers is life story work. Um, identity is very important for everybody. Um, but I feel it's a very difficult journey for looked after children because of um, issues with their autobiographical memory and actually it falls on the adults around them to help piece together some of their journey. Um, so life story work is, you know, it's essentially a book that we would encourage foster carers to create with pictures, significant memories, milestones, you know, and the idea is that at some point, you know, the child can reference that book and, and have a sort of coherent visual narrative of their journey.